Welcome everybody. It's nice to see so many people here in person and it's nice to see a few people on Zoom. Um, I hope I won't miss anybody. Please, by all means, if you want to say anything, say anything, contribute. It's not just me, it's all of us together. The title of my talk today is To Tree or Not To Tree. Flowers and greenery on Shavuos. Where does it come from? What are the, what are the thoughts and feelings of um, the rabbis, what do they think about it? And where, where are the roots? Where do we find, um, yeah, there's gonna be a few of those, look out for them. Okay, first of all, thank you to Rabbi Lawrence and all the team at Kinloss. I'd like to dedicate the learning today, Le'ilu Nishmas, my mother-in-law, Bruria Bas Shlomo, who passed away on Hanukkah, and she absolutely loved flowers and always took the time to appreciate Hashem expressing himself in the world and saw the beauty of the flowers and the trees. And even now, my kids walk past, you know, the beautiful autumn leaves and they say, oh, Bobby would love this. So um, difficult for all of us. Um, where does the minhag to have trees or flowers in the shul and in homes come from? Now, before I start, the reason why we're so focused on Shavuos about minhagim is because we don't have a specific mitzvah. For example, um, Rosh Hashanah is blowing the shofar, it's Yom Hadin. On, Yom, on Pesach, we've got matzah, mara, seder night, it's all exciting. Shavuos, it's cheesecake, so it's just eating milky foods, staying up late, which actually probably there's a better source to stay up late on um, seder night all night, rather than um, Tikkun Lel Shavuos. Um, but so we focus a lot more on the minhagim, which is what, uh, what we're going to focus on today. So the first place to look, everyone's got a source sheet, is the Shulchan Arach in Arach Chaim 4943. And um, that, that is written by the, um, the Machaber, the Rav Yosef Cairo, um, who um, died in 1575. And the Ramah, who's the Ashkenazi um, uh, rabbi who wrote his own sort of version of the Shulchan Arach at the same time, he wrote a glossary on the Shulchan Arach. And he says, we have a custom, he doesn't say we have to, it's a mitzvah. We have a custom to spread out greenery, grasses, in the synagogues, and in houses. This is reminding us of the joy that we had at the time of the giving of the Torah. Now, think about the word lishtoach. It means like shatiach in modern Hebrew is carpet. Asovim, Asev, would probably grass. We're not entirely sure what, he, what he's referring to. He doesn't say prochim, flowers. He says asovim, greenery, okay? And the Mishnah Bura, the Chofetz Chaim, Rabbi uh, Yisrael Meir Kagan, who passed away in 1933, in his um, fantastic... Uh, uh, commentary on, on the, the Mishnah Brura um, uh, around the same place. He says, why do we, why are we remembering Matan Torah and greenery, the joy? Why, what is the connection between the giving of the Torah and the greenery? What's the connection? So those people who remember the school from, the song from primary school, I am a mountain so very high, I can reach right up to the sky. All the mountains were arguing, I want the Torah to be given on me and I want the Torah to be given on me. And then little Hasin, I just stood there inside. I know I'm not tall, I know I'm not wide, right? So with, the idea was that, mutter, that, 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 that the, the Sinai, Mount Sinai was in the desert and he had no special fantastic qualities. But the Mishnah Brura tells us, Shehoyu Shom Asovim Soviv Har Sinai. There were grass, there was grasses, foliage, greenery around Har Sinai. Now, what's fascinating for those who, people who can like think about Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we're going to take a little bit of the to a tour of a lot of the festivals this week, the, uh, the, today. Um, when, we, when we sing, um, it's one of my favourite pieces, Haben Yakir Li Ephraim, just before that we say, Zachar Shem says, Zachar Tilach Chesed Neorayech. Hashem remembers the, the kindness, we remember the kindness uh, of our youth, Ahavas Kulul Asayach, Lech Teich Acharai Bamidbar, that we went and followed Hashem in the desert, Be'eretz, Lo Zorua, in a land that was not sown. That comes from Yirmiyahu, it's not on your sheet. Yirmiyahu, chapter two, verse two. 
So anyone who goes now to Eilat on the way when you're driving past the desert, there's not that much beautiful greenery, although obviously Israel has done a tremendous job together with uh, Karen Kayeme and JNF and all the funds to try and rebuild Israel. I know my own grandparents, whenever it was our birthday or whenever we had, when we were born or our children were born, they have a forest somewhere up in the north and they literally bought as a gift for us a hundred trees in our name and they have like a little forest which is grown, which is really... Yeah, you're absolutely obvious planning to uh, plant a tree for the, for the jubilee. They're going to plant a tree for every member. Wow, that's really incredible. I don't know if you could hear that on Zoom, but um, they said they're going to try, the United Synagogue are going to try and plant trees in Israel, which is quite remarkable for every single member. So, one second. That's here, yes, that's right. Yes, it's here. Yes, it's here. The Shufa, it's the Shufa project. I think it's here. Well, they're going to plant trees in England. Yes. Okay, I think it'd be more remarkable to plant trees in Israel. I'm not criticising the project. I'm sure they looked into it. Maybe they're doing it in both. Okay, right, I've got some applause from uh, the, the Zoomers. Okay, so what does that mean? That there was grass, but we thought that it's a desert and little Harasinai was, you know, it, it was a land that was not sown. So there is this idea, when Hashem, sort of his presence was emanating from Harasinai, it sort of, like let out a sort of uh, a spiritual charge and something that was before not blooming and blossoming with flowers. There is this idea that, according to the Mishnah Bora, there were grasses in a place where we wouldn't expect there to be grasses, almost like, I don't know, we, 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 we say the same, Roim es hakolos, they they heard the, they, they saw the thunder, the th the sounds, it was almost very supernatural. There was some sort of supernatural goings on. And there is an idea that every single person who stood at Har Sinai, everybody saw and everybody heard, which meant that everybody was cured of their physical ailments because everybody was able to come to Har Sinai. So this is quite fascinating for me, is that in a place where we say we're gonna remember Matan Torah and the Mishnah Bura says, because there was green grass there, but yet we think that we're in a desert and there's no grass there. But clearly, there was some sort of miraculous, something took place there, part of the spirituality, the, 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 man, the manifestation of Hashem's presence, the Shekhinah, made there to be grass. And because of that, we think about it, we're remembering Shavuos, the time that we got with Zaman Matan Tarasenu, and we're remembering the miracles that took place at Har Sinai. So that is... Um, that is one uh, idea, and I want to back up that there was grass in Har Sinai, even though if we go to the place where we think Har Sinai might be, um, except for the wonderful irrigation that uh, Israel has put up, if we see in Source 3 in Shemos, Perek Lamad Dalet Posset Gimel, the people were, Moshe was told, Ve'ish lo ya'ele imoch, nobody should come out the mountain with you, Ve'gam ish al yera b'chol ha'ha gam hatzom v'habaka al yiru el mul ha'ha ha'hu. No one else was allowed to come up the mountain with Moshe. No one else should be anywhere on the mountain. Neither shall the flocks and herds graze at the foot of this mountain. So why did Hashem tell Moshe that? because there must have been grass, because he's not gonna say, don't graze on this table, there's no grass on this table. So I think that's quite fascinating that there's actually in the Torah, we understand there was foliage on Har Sinai in a place that was a desert that we are told, Bar Midbar Be Eretz Lo Zorua. And it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a place that had greenery and grass. So that's my first suggestion about why we have it, because we're remembering Matan Torah and the miraculous nature of the fact that there was a spiritual infusion and that had some sort of physical manifestation as well. And there was grass on Har Sinai, which we're remembering the wonders that were done for us at, the Mount, at Mount Sinai when the Torah was given. So that's my first suggestion and um, my first point. The second one, um, look at source four on your sheet. This comes, this is quoted by the Medrash Talpios, who's Rabbi Eliyahu Kohen, Ha Kohen of Izmir, who died in 1729 in Izmir, Turkey. And, um, and he refers us to the Gemara in Shabbos, which is source four on your sheet, Peiches Beis. Um, and he says, sorry, Peiches Omud Beis, Kol dibor v'dibor she yotzo mipi ha-kodesh baruchu 
with every utterance that Hashem said from his mouth, Nismale kol ha'olam kulo besomim. The entire world was filled with fragrant spices. And the Medrash Talpios tells us that flowers give an aroma. Now, smell has some sort of a very interesting quality. We, we smell the basomim or Motzei Shabbos, and we're told that when we smell the basomim on Shabbos, when Shabbos leaves and the radiance of Shabbos leaves us, we might feel like weak or faint. So we smell the basomim to sort of wake us up from this like lack of spiritual, a withdrawal of spirituality. But when the Torah was given in Har Sinai, the, the, the Gemara tells us that we had fragrant spices with every sentence that came out of Hashem's words. Now, flowers have this aroma. In fact, if you smell flowers, there's a certain flowers you smell that have this aroma. We say there's a brocha, bore isve besomim, and people sometimes use roses or something like that for havdolah, not just cloves, which is a bit more traditional, but people do use fragrant flowers. An aroma can lift a person's mood. It isn't just a physical thing. A person can have, why do shops, for example, I mean, I walked in today and the smell is incredible. Somebody's making barbecue. Something about smell, you almost have like a, I don't want to say a spiritual uplift. I'm not talking about smelling barbecue. Maybe not, that's not everybody's taste. And some people are very sensitive to smell. And the, the aroma, or the fragrant aroma of flowers can lift a person's mood. And the idea is that with Hashem giving every single one of the Aceres Adibras, there was this idea that there was a fragrant aroma and this should have lifted our moods. And when we learn Torah, it's not just an academic exercise, like the way a smell can penetrate and lift a person's mood. I was thinking as I was speaking about coming in here and the smell of the barbecue, shops pay a lot of money like bakeries, if you walk into a bakery, that smell of a bakery entices you to spend money. There's like a science about smell and that, you know, if people smell, try to sell their house, they're supposed to, I don't know what it is, fry onions or bake fresh bread because that puts people into a good mood. So it's really quite fascinating that the Torah tells us that when the Torah was given, that the, the, the Gemara tells us when the Torah was given, the world was filled with fragrant spices. And because of that, we have flowers so that we have this idea that, the, that our homes and the shuls should be filled with fragrant spices. And when we learn Torah, we should understand it's not just an academic intellectual exercise, it should elevate a person's mood. So that's my second suggestion. Number three. Now this is even earlier, and for that, although we've already had a little whittle stop tour about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we're now going to turn our attention to the Purim story, would you believe it? Now, Purim story and flowers, where does this come from? So there's an even older source that seems to say that flowers were connected to Shavuos, and this comes from the Purim story itself. Rabbi Yosef um, David Azulai, known as the Chida, who passed away in Yerushalayim in 1806, cites an ancient Aramaic Midrash, and it's called the Targum Sheni. Now, the Targum Sheni takes a verse in the Megillah, and it's like you can have three lines of the Posuk, and you can have 25 lines of the Targum Sheni, because it's not a literal translation, it's a Midrashic interpretation of the words. Now, I'm not 100% sure if the source that I'm bringing in, source six, is this. Uh, this is the best version I could find. But as I can't read Aramaic, and I don't know if anybody else can, I don't know, maybe it doesn't really matter if it is. I mean, obviously it does really matter, but I've tried my best and I've taken Targum Esther. I hope this is actually Targum Shani, but the English translation is a paraphrase of Targum Shani. Here's what it says in the Posuk in the Megillah. Cast your mind back to Homon, who's trying to convince Ahasuerush to kill all the Jewish people. And he says, this is source five, in, in Esther Gimel Ches, Vayome Homon la Melech Achashverosh. And Homon says to Achashverosh the king, Yeshno am echad mufuza mufarad ben ha'amim. There is a people amongst your peoples scattered around your provinces, Vachomedinos machusecha, Vadose hem shonos mikol om. And they've got their own rules and regulations and they don't obey the king's commands. And I'm suggesting, this is Homon speaking, it's not in his majesty's interest to tolerate them. They're not listening to your laws. They're not listening. Let's look at the English translation of the Targum. I hope 
that the, he that the Aramaic is the he is the Aramaic of what I'm about to say. This is a rough draft translation. Instead of being those few five lines, it's much longer. And he says, Haman said to Achishverosh, the Jewish people have their own customs. Their laws are different to any of those of any other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. And then the Targum Sheni includes, they go to the synagogue and say prayers, cursing the king and his ministers. I'd like to suggest, because of this, it's possible that is why we have in our prayers, in our liturgy on Shabbos morning, that we have a prayer for the state and the queen. It's possible in response. Yeah, it does. I don't know where does it come it from in Yomiyah. Okay, I have been corrected. I'm sure. So one of my guests, I don't want to uh, no. publicise her without no. her permission. No. So she's no. saying that in Yomi Yahoo, so I'll have to check that up. I'm going to write it down. I'll check it up. It was quoted. Okay. Mm. What I'm saying is this could be another reason. If, if it is that Homon was sort of snitching up the Jews saying they they're not listening to your laws and they're not keeping your laws. So it, it, it actually in this Targum Shani, it says they go to the synagogue and, and curse the king and, and his ministers, which is awful. Um, and then he, it carries on to say, on Shavuos, they ascend to the roofs of their synagogues and spread flowers. They gather up the flowers and say, the same way we gather up the flowers, so may our enemies be gathered up. So this is really interesting because this dates the custom of having flowers in synagogues to the pre prum story. The roof. Or, you know, the roof. It's very interesting that it says, it says what it says. It's in, it's on. Um, what do you mean it's in or on? Well, if they say the roof of their synagogue, it's basically... I told you the translation is very free, so I don't read Aramaic well enough to be able to, I'm not going to be able to expound every single word. Well... And my Aramaic's not good enough, so I'm afraid I can't help you. And I hope this is the correct Aramaic uh, translation. This is Targum, but maybe there's more than one Targum. But I'm referring specifically to what the Targum Shani says. So that's really interesting. And I'm going to check up what uh, my the right honourable lady says on my left. And I will get back to you on that one. Right, so we can see that this, there is an idea that this already happened in, at the time of Purim when Homon was complaining about the Jewish people, this was already existing at that time. Now I'm going to move to another branch entirely. And I told you that we're gonna talk about to tree or not to tree. And this is what we're gonna talk about now. And that is the Mishnah Bura, which is source seven on your sheet, who says there's a custom to put up trees in the synagogue. Actually, no hagim lahamid ilonos bebeis hakneses uva botim. It's a custom to put trees, not grasses, which we spoke about before. Zeche Sheba Atzeres, because on Atzeres, which is another name for the festival of Shavuos, Nidono Al Peras Ha'ilon. The world, there is a judgment which takes place for the fruit of the trees. And that's the Mishnah Bura who passed away, or the Chavitz Chaim who passed away in 1933. And he is quoting the Mogen Avraham. He actually says, I'm quoting the Mogen Avraham, who passed away in 1682. And that was uh, Abraham Abela Gombina. And he lived in Poland. And this is the Mogen Avraham, source um, eight on your sheet. And he says, it's a minhag lishtoach asovim, which we had from the Mishnah, from the, from the Shulchan Aruch, which I quoted as source one. And he says, no hagim la hamid ilonos babote kinesios babotim. It's a custom to put up trees um, because it's sheyaskiru shebaat seres nidonin al peros ha'ilon that we are judged about the fruits of the tree, va yispalalu alehem, and we pray for them. Okay, that's source eight on your sheet. Now, where does the Mogen Avraham get that? I'd like to suggest it's from the Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah, which is source nine on your sheet, one, two. The Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah tells us, ba'arba parokim ha'olam nidon. There are four times of the year the world is judged. I had to keep it in because it's like, it comes before Shavuos. On Pesach al HaTavua, on the produce, we're judged on Pesach. Ba'at Seres, which is another name for Shavuos, al Peros HaIlon, that the fruit growing the tree is 
is judged on Shavuos. So that is why some people have the minhag to put trees, actual trees, in their shuls and in their homes on Shavuos. But, wait for my next pun, there is tremendous opposition to that, okay? And that is the Vilna Gon. And the Mishnah Bura tells us in source 10, Vahagra Bitel Min Hagzeh. And the Vilna Gon, who passed away in 1797, he, he, he abolished, I'd say, bitel. He, he cancelled the minhag, but it doesn't say he made it osa. He said, it says bitel. So I'm just saying that some people might have that minhag, but the Vilmagon was vehemently opposed to that. He, he was opposed to that. Why? Mishum she'achshav hu chok ha'amim laha'amid ilonos b'chag shelahem. Because the Vilmagon said... There is a ritual for the non-Jewish nations to put up trees on their holidays. So we can all assume that he's talking about, I don't know when it started, any decorations of trees, but specifically in our lives, that people who celebrate Christmas and then they have a Christmas tree. So then he's like, hold on a minute, if they're going to use trees at their festival, we are not going to because it would come under the prohibition of chukas hagoi. We should not do things like the nations of the world. We shouldn't dress like them. We shouldn't um, do, we shouldn't go to their activities, perhaps like, you know, if they had like things going on in the Colosseum, perhaps we shouldn't have gone to things like that. Even if there were shows of animals and things like that, we shouldn't do things and um, um, like the nations of the world. And this specific prohibition comes from source 11, Vayikra Yud Ches Gimel. Kamase Eretz Mitzrayim Ashei Yishavtem Bar Lo Sasu. Do not copy the practices of the land of Egypt where you dwelt. O Kamase Eretz Kanaan Ashe Ani Mevi Eschem Shama. And I brought you to the land of Canaan, but for, for like those people who live in Canaan, lo sa'asu, don't do what they do, uva chukoseichem lo se'lechu. So that's how we generally refer to this, chukas ha'goi. We should not follow the ways of the nations of the world. Um, so the, the Vilna Gaon said, right, trees have now become a symbol of the Christian festival, therefore we're not going to include that. Which is quite interesting because if it was an older custom to have trees or grass or greenery. Maybe specifically trees is what the Vilna Gaon was not happy about. There is a specific command about, uh, in, in Devorim, you, um, uh, Tess Zion Kaf Aleph, about not having an Asherah tree, which uh, an Asherah is perhaps known as, you could translate it as a sacred post, but basically it means where people used to have some sort of idolatry, idolatry, Got it? Um, where they would serve a tree. So if you look at the source 12, Lo sita lecha ashera, kol eitz eitzel misbech Hashem. You shall not set up a sacred post, an ashera, I suppose, tree, a pole of any kind besides the altar of Hashem. Misbech um, Hashem lekecha, asher sa'aser lach. That you should not, if you make an altar, do not set it up by a tree where people are going to worship by the tree. And the Ramban, Nachmanides, says um, on that Pasuk, he says, Ba'avo, source 13, Ba'avo shehu minhag ovde avoda zara, because it is the custom of those people who serve idols, who are idol worshippers, litos ilanos bepischei bote avoda zara shalahem. They customarily planted trees outside their idol worshipping places, their temples where people would visit, either so people should bow down to the trees or perhaps they wanted to make their temples beautiful and aesthetically pleasing so that passers-by would be attracted and come in and worship at their temples. So the Vilmagon was very against um, putting up trees um, on Shavuos in the shul, very against it. But not everybody was against it, and some people continued to adopt the practice that they had had before then. Okay, I'm just going to pause here if anybody would like to make any comments or say anything. Would shul still have trees? I don't know. You can, you can do the research and get back to me. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. I've seen beautiful flower arrangements, and some people have plants. But plants are also problematic because of muksa and shabbos and moving them and opening and closing curtains. So, I don't know. Some people just have cut flowers. So... I don't know. We can do a research project and get back to me for next time, please God. Yeah?
fold would be a many fold approach. Perhaps. That would be, because that goes back to pagan times. Right. Or maybe whatever, let's say a pole, uh, like I don't know what pole, I don't know how to trade because it says lotis talacha asherah, you should not set up an asherah, but maybe it could also refer to a stone column, but that would probably be called matseva, I don't know. But it means anything that people would have and they would have it and then worship whatever it was, uh, a maypole. Yeah, the subject, but because I buy a lot of people got I don't know. I don't know. So that's another whole subject. Um, what one of the participants spoke about is Chukas and having dogs. Dogs could be quite complicated to make brochas in front of dogs. I don't know. Uh, and muksa on Shabbos, are you allowed to look after an animal that's not in your care if someone else touches the animal? Uh, and also trapping, sod, you know, if you take a dog and put it in your house and shut the door, is that called trapping? I know it would only be Midorabonon, but I'm not sure how that would work. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of halachas. I'm not an expert in any. I'm sorry? No, you didn't interrupt me. It's every. interesting subject to talk about once. So, um, people have got dogs, and I'm from people, not in Stanford at all, but going to be named in Edgeworth. I don't know. I don't know enough about it, but I think the biggest problem people have is closing the door on Shabbos. Because if you come in your house, how do you trap it? Because you're trapping the dog. I know, but some people say that it depends on if there's a young child or if there's a danger of the sting. Yeah. So then you've got a situation where you could be. You're in danger. So if you're in danger, then it's difficult. It's a different situation. I know, but also. Okay. Also, that in uh, in that in, in the uh, in the base in the base Hamidrash and in the Mishkan, the reason why they trapped animals was to trap animals for the skins or for um, for for carbonos. So they didn't trap lions, for example. They wouldn't have trapped a wasp. It would so it would be it would be a midrabbonon. But I don't know enough about the subject, but just interesting seeing, as you mentioned, dog dogs. Can bite. I'm sorry? A dog can bite. A dog can bite, yeah. But don't forget, the dogs, we owe the dogs a bit of gratitude because when the Bnei Yisrael left Egypt, no dog um, uh, uh, barked, so, you know, he didn't wet his tongue. So they kept it very quiet. Okay? Right, so let's move on to um, the next suggestion, why we have flowers and trees. Uh, these are all like, uh, all source-based. Why we have flowers and trees on, on Shavuos. And for that, we're going to look at source 14. And this um, uh, quotes somebody called the Pardus Yosef, who's Rabbi Yosef Poznovsky, um, um, who passed away late 1880s. And he says, Ra'isi, source number 14, Ra'isi b'shem hagon Rabbi Mordechai Banet. I saw in the name of a rabbi called Rabbi Mordechai Banet, who probably lived in the 1700, late 1700s. Um, we have a reason why we, plot, we put out plants or grasses on, um, on Shavuos, because the Zion Adar, on the seventh of Adar, no lad Moshe. So that's something we know, that Moshe was born on the seventh of Adar. And we're going to look in a minute um, at Pesukim, which are going to help us understand this, and the Gemara and Sukkah to understand this. And we know that Moshe was hidden for three months. So work out the maths. His mum couldn't keep him. So he was hidden for three months. Adar, doesn't work in a, in a, in a leap year, but Adar, Nisan, Iyar, Sivan. So if he was hidden for just a day short of three months, he would have been hidden in the bulrushes on the 6th or 7th of Sivan, which is exactly the day that we had Matan Torah. So let's just look at the Pesukim. So if you look at source 15, in Shemos, base, Posuk base and Gimel, Vata isha vateled ben, and she gave birth and she had a son. Vatera um, who she saw that he was good. The Medrash says that his name, maybe his name was Tov, or he had some sort of special light emanating from him, or maybe he was born with Brismila. There was something special about this baby. Vatitzpenehu shlosha Yerochim, and she hid him for three months. Moshe's mother hid baby Moshe, Yochevet hid Moshe for three months. She couldn't hide him anymore. And she took him and she put him into a wicker basket, which she covered it with bitumen and pitch. And she put him 
in the suf, which are the reeds. So because baby Moshe was hidden in the reeds and in grateful thanks to Moshe who became the greatest Eved Hashem and was the person who went up the mountain of Sinai and came down and gave us the Torah, he was put in a basket of reeds on Shavuot. Now I have to have, um, give you a little bit of intellectual honesty and say that the Gomorrah in Sota says Moshe was either hidden, according to some opinions, on the 21st of Nisan, which became um, 80 years later, the day that we actually um, crossed the Yom Suf, or the other opinion is that he was hidden on the 6th of Sivan. So according to the opinion that says he was hidden on the 6th of Sivan, let's look at source 16, the Gemara in Sota tells us, the ministering angel said to Hashem, Rebono shall olam, God on high, the master of the universe, Misha osid lekabel Torah mehar sinai beyom zeh, the person who is destined to get the Torah and receive the Torah on behalf of the Jewish people on this day, what's the significance of on this day? Yilke beyom zeh, will he be smitten? Will something bad happen to him on this day? Okay, so we're saying, according to the opinion who says he was, he, he was found, he was put into the river on the 6th and 7th of Sivan, it was three months after his birth. And from this we see that Moshe was born on the 7th of Adar, and he was kept by his mother until the 6th of Adar, and hidden in the, in the reeds. And the reeds themselves, he was hidden, so to speak, in the suf, in the reeds. That's why some people have got the uh, minhag to have water flowers. That's what um, Rabbi, um, uh, the Paradis Yosef, quoting the um, Rabbi Mordechai Banet, which is really fascinating, which ties in Shavuos and Moshe being born, which is the Pesach story again. I did tell you we were going to go on a little bit of a around the year trip. Okay, let me just have a look at the time. Um, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to move to source. One second. Give me one second. I'm going to move to source. I'll finish on 18. I will move to source. One second. My next page. Where is it? Four, five. It must be five. Okay. So uh, let's move, move to source 21 and then we'll move back to the other ones afterwards because we've got time, thank God. Um, source 21. Another idea about sharing the idea of Shavuos and flowers is because the, so the story of Shavuos took place, it's, we know, Shavuos is known as Chag HaKotzer. It happens at the time of the harvest. So the whole Megillah Rus story is set in the fields with the wheat and the vegetables and the fruit ripening. So we're thinking harvest, we're thinking outside. Another name for Shavuos is Chag HaBikurim. So we are thinking about the Bikurim. So first of all, if you look at source 21, Shemos Lama Dalet, Chag HaShavuos Ta'asel L'cha Bikurei Ketzei Chitim, Chag HaOsif Tukufas Hashana. You shall observe the festival of Shavuos, source 21, the first fruits, the wheat harvest, the feast of the ingathering of the produce of the year. So we are sort of harking back to the fact that we were, it was a harvest festival and we offer plants and, and harvest. Also in Bar Midbar, Kaf Ches Kaf Vov, Bayom Habikurim, Bahak Kriv Chem, Mincha Hadasha, Bash La Shem Le Shavua Sechem, Mikra Kodesh Yalachem, Kamalachazavadala Sasu. On the day that you offer up the Bikurim, the first fruits, we have appreciation to Hashem for Him bringing the rain and the sun at the right time to help us make our flowers and fruits and vegetables grow. We give thanks to Hashem and we acknowledge that at that time of the year, it's the time of the harvest. And in fact, people had the custom to adorn the baskets of Bikurim as well as the oxen leading the procession to the base Hamikdash with flowers and greenery. So that's another idea. And another one. Okay, this one comes, this is source 23, but the Bnei Yisascha explains, he passed away in 1841, explains that people had the custom to beautify the holiday with flowers um, because of a pasuk in Shir Hashem, which I haven't, haven't put on the source sheet, had to leave some things that I couldn't have more than five pages. Kashoshana ben hachochim ken ra'ayosi ben habonos. A rose among the thorns, so is my beloved amongst the daughters. So the children of Israel are compared to a flower, a rose among thorns. 
And on that subject, there's a most fascinating midrash in, Pasha, in, in, uh, in Vayikra Rabbah, which is source 23. And this is also to do with Shavuos, and again, a connection to Bnei Israel, Hashem, and the giving of the Torah. 23. Moshol Lamela. This is a parable of a king. Shehoyo lo pardes notua, who had planted um, uh, an orchard. Shurura shall te'enim, shall gafonim, shall rimonim, shall tapuchim. He grew um, rows of figs, vines, pomegranates, and apples. Umasala oris v'halachlo. He entrusted it to a tenant, and he went away. La'acha yomim boha melech. After a certain amount of time, the king came. V'heit sispa pardes leida me me osa. And he sort of came past, and he wanted to see what was going on in his orchard. Umotso u mole chochin v'dar dar. Rin, and he found it covered in thorns and um, bristles. Hevi katsotsim lakutso. He brought woodcutters to cut it down, to chop it down. Vehit sits baosan hachochim vara bo shoshana echad shel vared. Vared. And he looked closely and he noticed that there was this most beautiful, beautiful flower, a beautiful single rose amongst the thorns. Notla veheriachba, he smelt, he stopped and he smelt it. Vashavta nafsha ale, sorry, and his spirit was calmed, which is interesting because that goes back to what we said at the beginning about the fragrance, how that can calm a person's spirit. Omaha Melech, the king said, Bishvil Shoshanazo, because of this beautiful rose, ye not sell kolha prades, I'm going to save the whole orchard. And this is the this is the nimshal. This is the explanation of the parable. So the whole world is saved because of the Torah. Hashem saw one beautiful rose, a rose amongst the thorns. Elu Yisrael. Hashem saw the nation, the children of Israel. Unotla vehericha. And when he he took it and he smelt it. When Hashem gave the children of Israel the Ten Commandments, and his spirit, Hashem's spirit was calmed when he gave them the Torah. When the Jewish nation said, we will do and we will listen on Shavuos, when we, we have Matan Torah, we said, Hashem said, because of this precious rose among thorns, the Jewish nation, the whole, the whole orchard is worthy of being saved. Torah v Yisrael yinotzel ha'olam. Because of the children of Israel and because of the Torah, Hashem said, I will save the world. So this Midrash is another idea of why we have flowers on Shavuos, because we have the idea of this imagery that Hashem has created the world and there's lots of problems within the world. I'm not saying we don't have our own problems within the Jewish community, but he says because of the beauty of the Torah and the beauty of the children of Israel and the imagery is that of a flower because of that we have flowers on on Shavuos itself time for another two okay the Torah describes this is Reuven this is in the book of Boratius um, when Reuven went out in the days of the harvest and he had brought a flower or we think it's flowers do daim we're not exactly sure entirely what it was something maybe it mandrakes, maybe violets, to his mother. Rachel, perhaps she thought that the flowers were um, a fertility drug or maybe an aphrodisiac. It's a very complicated story for another time. And she says to Leah, please give me some of your son's dudaim. And Leah says, okay, if you want to have my son's dudaim, I'll trade it with you for a night with Yaakov. Okay, it's your turn to be with Yaakov tonight, but if you want the flowers, I will be with Yaakov tonight. And when Leah is with Yaakov that evening, she becomes pregnant. And from that pregnancy, she has her baby called Yisacha. So let's look at source 24. Vayelech Ruvain b'meikat sechetim. It's the time of the harvest. Vayimotsa dudoim. We don't know exactly what it was, but it's something basode in the field. Vayove osom. 
el lea imo, batome rochel el lea, tani tanali midoda e benech. Please give me some of your mandrakes, violets. We'll just translate it as dudaim. What the fascinating thing is, we can see it says ketzir chitim, which is we know that is Shavuos time. And the Al Sheikh says this story took place on the festival of Shavuos. Now this is very strange, and that's another whole topic on itself, how something could predate Matan Torah because the Jews hadn't gone into Egypt, let alone come out of Egypt. But we're saying it was at the same time of the year, the same spiritual energy of the year. Perhaps that is why we have Shavuos at that time, why it's called Chakakotzeh, because it is the time of the harvest. Anyway, Rabbi Moshe al Sheikh, who passed away in 1593, explains that well, well, let's read what he says together, source 25. And it's possible we can understand the meaning of the verse, that he, it, this took place at the time of the harvest, who Erev Shavuos, this took place on Erev Shavuos, because it's a time when we are commanded to bring in the harvest. So we know that, um, Pesach is the time of gathering in the barley and the time of Shavuos is gathering in the wheat and that's why we count the Omer between the, those two festivals and then it becomes the time of the, the wheat harvest. This was the night of Shavuos and it was the night of Matan Torah. Shehu leil rotzon shel matan Torah. It's an evening of great, des- it's a desirous time. And ace rotzon is like a time when it's um, Hashem, so to speak, his ears are open to listening to what our requests are. Va'al ken yotzah yisachar. And yisachar, the tribe who is known for learning the Torah, we know there's a famous partnership between Yisachar and Zavulun where Yisachar would learn and Zavulun would be merchants and, and support the, t- the tribe of Yisachar. Shekol Taras Yisrael Hayob B'Shivto, that he was known as, from him, from the tribe of Yisachar, emanated most of the Torah scholars. And we know that Leah called her son Yisachar, but Tikra Shemo Yisoscha, with two, with two shins, Bishte Shinin, with two shins, Shehu Al Kavana Social HaTorah, and his name, although we call him Yisachar, it's got two shins and one is silent because this it's a play on the words Yesh Sachar. Yisachar is Yesh Sachar, which is a talk for another another whole talk on Yisachar's name being called Yesh Sachar. Shehu o al ohaveha Torah hu shevet Yisachar. Yisachar had a great merit, Yesh Sachar. There was a merit to Yisachar, we call him Yisachar, but his name really should be Yisoschar, because he had the great merit of learning Torah. It was A, at the time of Shavuos, and B, that because it was the time of Shavuos, which is the time when we received the Torah, Yisachar, who was the greatest, the tribe who was the greatest emanator of the Torah, that is when we got the Torah. And that was the same time, many years preceding Matan Torah, because a link to the way that it says it was at the time of the Ketzir Chitim. Now, the, ne- the last um, uh, connection between Shavuos and flowers is, is possibly my favourite one. And for that, although I did not do biology and I'm not at all a scientist, the idea of flowers and growing. Now, when I was teaching in primary school around Tubishvat, I did a little experiment and I did it with a bean because I thought that would last the longest be the quickest experiment and the kids wouldn't have to wait for such a long time. And what we did was each child was given a bean and a cup and water and we put it there and we left it by the sunlight and we wanted to see how the miracle of nature packed within a seed, how that could grow up and how from a tiny seed it would grow into a plant. And what I did as a controlled experiment because we put it by the window in the classroom as a controlled experiment I wanted to explain to them as a, side, as a side point, the science behind it. And I took one seed and I put it without water, but next to the window. And I took another seed and I put water in it and I put it inside a cupboard and I shut it and I left it there. Now you can all imagine what had happened, but it was a very interesting science project, as well as learning about the wonders of nature. We need... I'm not the expert of photosynthesis, and I don't want to talk about carbon dioxide and chlorophyll and chloroform and all that, but whatever, I don't know enough about it. But suffice it to say, 
Everybody knows we need a seed, a flower, we need water, and we need light, sunshine. Now, bear with me for a minute. The Torah is compared to light and the Torah is compared to water. So the first thing I'd like to compare to the Torah is, uh, is compared to light is in, from the Gemara Megillah, which is source 18 on your sheet. You have to turn back a page. Sorry for that. Coming from Layahudim Haisa Ora of Simcha Vasasan Vikar, going back to the Purim story, the Jews had Ora Simcha Vasasan Vikar, and the Gemara explains, Rabbi Yehuda says, Ora, you want to know what Ora is? The Jews had light. What does that mean? Ora zu Torah, the light of Torah. When a person has Torah, they have clarity and they have a, a clearer understanding. The chain who omer kine mitzvah of Torah are. So there's another posuk that the candle of a mitzvah and the light and the Torah is is light. So a person's understanding is is illuminated. For example, we could say that that is light as a reference to Torah. And how is Torah a reference to water? And this is from the Gemara Baba Kama Yud Zayin Aleph, source 19 on your sheet. Ein Mayim El Torah. Whenever we have the reference to water, we're talking about Torah. And there is an idea that a person cannot survive three days without water. And a person cannot survive three days without Torah. And perhaps that's why the rabbis instituted that people had to do laning on Mondays, Thursdays and Shabbos, that we should never have a three day gap without Torah. The idea is a person can't survive without Torah. In fact, when a person gets called up to make a bracha, a birchas Torah on the Torah, when they come down from the Torah and they say just before, when they when they when they finish the portion that's read in the shul, birchas Torah, they say baruch ata Hashem elokeinu melech alam. Source twenty on your sheet. Asher nosan lanu Torahs emes. Thank you Hashem for giving us Torahs emes, which refers to according to um, the Shulchan Aruch. If anyone wants to look it up, one three nine ten that it refers to Torah Shabbat Sav, the actual written Torah. V'chaye olam nata basocheinu. Anyone ever wondered what that meant? And Hashem implanted within us eternal life. And according to the Shulchan Aruch, that means we're referring to the Torah Shebaal Peh, the oral Torah. Because within each and every one of us, we have within us a seed planted within us, that we have captured within our imagination, our own expansion and understanding of the Torah. So it starts off with the Mishnah and the Gemara, and then perhaps our own ideas, and that is eternal. And we carry on and we learn things. And when we think about this, that flowers can only survive with the light and the water of Torah, we can only survive. Look at the imagery in this, in this bracha. It's planted within us that we have, each of us has, so to speak, a seed planted within us. Now again, I don't know enough about the science, but a seed is tiny. It decomposes before it becomes a flower or a plant. It breaks apart. It's put into a muddy, dark, dank place, okay? And so think about our own the Jewish history, we were put, Yosef was put into Egypt. The whole Jewish nation was put into Egypt. We come out of Mitzrayim, this deep, dark place where we almost decompose completely. We are seeds. We look like a speck of dirt. There's nothing to show for it. All you've got is mud on your hands if you're planting a flower. But then with the water and the sunlight, the, the seed sprouts, breaks through the surface. After a few days, you have shoots. One leaf becomes two leaves. Then after a month, you'll see a bud. And then perhaps after the seven weeks, using the imagery of the Sephira Saoma, there will be a beautiful flower. We are like, for us, the Torah is our water and it is our light. And we cannot survive without the Torah. We are all a seed that came from the dark, deep impurities of Egypt. We all have within us the desire to grow. We need to make sure that we set down roots, that we think back to the people that came before us. We need the water, the Ein Mayim Elah Torah. We need the water of Torah. We need the light, yes? So Ora Zu Torah. On Shavuos, as we accept once again, we are Makabel the Torah, Zman Matan Torah Senu. 
even though things are difficult and around the world things are difficult and goodness knows what's still going on in the Ukraine and our own difficulties and the latest issues that we've had and that we've always had in, in the land of Israel. We have light, beauty and excitement and whatever happens, we hope that we will come out at the end of Sefirah Saoma, emerging as our own beautiful flower. Mm. And I think there are so many poems and, and here's a little picture that I got about like how the seed grows if you look at Source 25. There are so many beautiful poems about flowers and growing and about the beauty of flowers. And I hope that um, on Shavuos this year, that when you see flowers, or perhaps you can let me know if you see any trees, that the, the source of the Min Hogim and the connections of, let's just try and see if we can remember, who can remember one of the Min Hogim, where it comes from? Anyone wants to be brave enough to remember something that I said today? I think I said uh, seven or eight sources. Anyone remember any? Please say someone remembers one. Shirley, don't let me down. <laughs> one. One each, come on. Quickly get in there first, because you can remember the first one then. Megillas Estus. Estus, we see the source of the Minhag comes from the Targum Shani, which says, Homon tells Ahasuerus, remember these people, they don't listen to your laws. Look what they used to do. They used to throw flowers down, gather them in and say, the same way we've gathered up the flowers, that's, um, we, um, we would like our enemies to be gathered up. Thank you, Barry. So referring back to Moshe, who was put in the bulrushes, the reeds by the riverbank, three months he was hidden. He was born on the 7th of Adar. And here we have Shavuos on the 7th of, 7th of Sivan. Shirley? What sources are you actually asking for? Just no, any? No, I'm just saying, any, if you've heard of something yourself or something that I said today, we're just going to do a little review of what we said in the last few minutes. Just alive. The whole, the whole idea of this period in Shavuot was that when we once had light, that we can blossom like flowers. Once we had light, once we had, we crossed the symbolism, if you like, of the Yam Suf, there was those symbolic water given to us as, a, as the beginning of our freedom, crossing over the Red Sea. I don't know if everybody could hear what Shirley said. She was saying about the fact that. As, as Jews, we were in the darkness as a seed almost destroyed and we came out of the deep, dark place and we became a flower. And she said the symbolic water of crossing the water of the Yam Suf, we then, um, we were, um, we got the Torah. So remember we spoke about the greenery on Har Sinai, that perhaps it was a desert and it was deserted. And then it, it, it came, it was, there was foliage, miraculous. The fragrance of Torah, how perfume can wake us up and elevate our spirits. The, the idea that trees are judged on, on Shavuos, that the Vilna Gon opposed this minhag. Um, let me just have a look. Where am I? I, like, I don't want to go, I don't want to miss anything out. You know what I mean? Um, the idea, yeah. If there was nothing to graze on. So Shirley was just saying, people didn't hear, that there must have been greenery on, on the Har Sinai because there was something to graze on. Okay, we spoke about the idea that Shavuos is the harvest time. The story of Ruth takes place at the harvest time to do with Bikurim and the decorations with beautiful flowers. The connection to the garden where the whole world is saved because of this beautiful one rose of Israel. The Dudaim and Yisachar's birth who became a great Torah scholar. And for me, the miracle of nature the miracle of nature that we, it's a daily miracle, so perhaps people don't notice it. On Shavuos, 
We see Hashem's hands every day is a miracle, but because we see it every day, we take it for granted. But when you go out and you see it's been plenty of rain, not that much sun, but maybe in the next few days we'll have a bit of sun. Um, may your spirits be uplifted by the fragrance of Torah on this Shavuos. And I thank you all for joining and participating. Have a wonderful Yontov.